Hi class, Dr. J here. And my intention today is to provide a summary lecture on the content of our multicultural studies class this quarter. I'm going to frame it through Alan Johnson's book, Privilege, Power, and Difference. And I'll be focusing in particular on getting on the hook. In other words, um, taking responsibility for one's power and privilege and attempting to be the change that we want to see in the world. In a sense, getting on the hook is uh, facing reality. It means uh, being committed, obliged, and involved in the world in which we interact. In a word, it means being a responsible adult. One of the ways in which we can do so is to be aware of and take responsibility for our own privilege. The opposite of that is to try to get off the hook of responsibility and to behave in such a way is to live in an illusion and in denial as if one could choose uh, whether or not to participate in society. As if one can live in a society and at the same time feel that they are not connected to the systems of that society and the consequences of those systems. So we're talking about a shift in perspective, a change in our perspective. We know that one of the tenets of Alan Johnson is, is that the trouble that we find in whatever society we live in affects everyone in the society. We understand that the flip side of privilege is oppression. So since each of us has some areas in which we are privileged, we must understand that privilege in relationship to the potential oppression of others in those particular categories. So throughout any system, people are impacted by the trouble of the system. It is not just the targets of the oppression who are impacted. It's important to understand that everyone participating in the system, both the agents and the targets. And of course, we can have agency or be targeted in different categories, uh, in different places. And so people have both qualities, most human beings of being both an agent and a target. And in some areas, we know that it's situationally determined. And so one can go into a particular area and feel as if they have agency and in another circumstance, they might find that they're targeted in the very same category. And so you could take a category such as gender. One might feel that they have agency, say being um, uh, a male with regard to their gender, but they could find themselves in a situation where their gender is actually being problematized and scrutinized and it could be done in a way that maybe is not uh, comfortable to that person. So the true would be, uh, the same would be true of other categories. So for instance, race, you might feel that you have agency when you're associating with people from your own uh, racial background. And then when you find yourself isolated, let's say in the context of dominant culture, and you're coming from a minoritized culture, you would find yourself targeted because of your race. So that's important. But because we understand that, that uh, privilege is ubiquitous and that it impacts everyone, 
then we understand from that follows that it's everyone's responsibility to address the flip side of privilege, which is oppression. And you can only do that by starting to own your own privilege. Some have thought that oppression, say racial oppression or gender oppression is something of the past. And hopefully by now we're clear that no, it takes a different form in the present. It might not be as explicit as it was in the past, but it is still part of the living reality. And we have to look at it from different perspectives sometimes in order to appreciate that it still exists and that sexism, racism, classism, heterosexism still functions in ways that harm other people, both at a personal, interpersonal, institutional, and global level. So we're talking about really a change of behavior. The challenge we face is to focus on processes that are oppressive, like excluding, um, rejection, harassment, discrimination, violence, death as a result of violence. We have to identify, we have to utilize the language, and we have to identify specifically where the um, particular type of targeting and oppression exists. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we know that these systems, classism, uh, sexism, have existed for hundreds and even thousands of years. But at the same time, we have to understand that they are in fact dynamic. And so they are changing over time, taking different forms over time, but they're deeply rooted. So we have to think about the trouble of oppression in um, more reflective ways. We have to think about the systemic elements and we have to also be able to look at the individual elements of the trouble or of the oppression. We have to be able to distinguish the explicit from the implicit, the unconscious from the conscious, you see. So our behavior needs to be reflective of our ability to have a more nuanced understanding of the trouble that we find ourselves in. To not accept that premise is to do nothing and to assume be that because I'm a nice person, I'm not really part of the problem. I'm not part of the trouble of ethnocentrism, of religious hegemony, of classism, of racism, of heterosexism, of ableism, and all the other ways in which humans distinguish one another and also um, demean and dehumanize one another. To assume that I'm not part of that is often reflective of our individual perspective. We see ourselves as good people and we believe that because we have training that tells us to, go, to be a good person, that we are in fact a good person. But it's a little more complicated than that, right? We have to think about unconscious bias as an example. I might see myself as a fair and decent person who doesn't harm people, but I have to understand that I have been socialized in a world that say is patriarchal. And I have adopted certain opinions about girls and women and about the place of boys and men and male identified and female identified individuals, right? That perpetuate a system of patriarchy. Whether I'm a nice person or not does not change the fact that patriarchy is often part of the institution of the family in which we're raised if not our immediate family, our extended family. 
So we have to examine a little bit more carefully the systems that we participate in. And one of the things we know is that systems socialize their participants to take the path of least resistance. And that's one of the greatest contributions of Alan Johnson, this, this notion. Uh, systems reward you for not making waves, for going along to get along, for floating down the mainstream of society. You're rewarded for that. And the opposite of that is often true, that one is punished in various different forms for taking the path of greater resistance, for going against the flow, for questioning when your role was to be silent. So this idea of the path of least resistance is important because what it often ends up being is for people ignoring the oppression around them, people accepting it as just the way things are, and therefore people thinking and saying and doing the things that perpetuate that oppression. They are, in a word, taking the path of least resistance, going with the flow of the mainstream. But what I think is important for us to understand is that even a dead piece of wood can float in the mainstream. So certainly human beings with all of our capacity, we should be able to learn how to do more than go along to get along to just go with the flow. We also have to, if we're going to make change in this world and be the change that we wanna see in the world, we have to become more comfortable with complexity. The world is not as simple as it is often reduced to in our imagination and our dialogue. So we have to reclaim these words that are often not spoken. We have to be able to talk about straight and queer people. We have to be able to talk about queer culture. We have to be able to talk about toxic male culture. This language is important because it helps us to not only problematize and contextualize the problems, but it gives us um, the tools that we would need to deconstruct many of these systems of oppression that we are part of. And we have to understand the idea that we are complicated human beings and that the systems that we interact with overlap one another. And so this leads us to a more nuanced understanding of the world in which we live. We have to be able to recognize when people might be um, targeted by multiple overlapping systems. And sometimes that targeting is sequential and sometimes it's simultaneous. So thinking systemically is important and understanding that we're all impacted by these systems and that we all participate in these systems is important, but also at an individual level, it's important for, for us to understand that just because um, I do not perceive myself as a bad person, say as a male, does not mean I don't participate in sexist systems, that I don't engage possibly unconsciously in sexist behavior or sexist language. And so the paradox of one being privileged and many times quite overprivileged and at the same time not realizing their privilege because that which is privileged is that which is nor normalized within society. And so when you're in the normative group, then you don't have to think much about your status. It's only when you're in a 
marginalized group, in a minoritized group, in an otherized group, that you reflect more on your status. So the paradox of privilege is something that individuals will need to begin to problematize in order for them to move to the positionality of being the change you want to see in the world and getting on the hook. Understanding that oppression is complex. There's really a matrix of domination that exists in the world. And any particular individual has multiple categories, identity categories that can um, impact them in different ways depending upon the situations that they're in. So the, we have overlapping systems, we have multiple systems, and we have intersecting systems where in different times and in different place, different identity categories are coming into play and are more salient than other identity categories. And if we can appreciate that complexity, then we can understand why, for instance, in the Black Lives Matter movement, for many um, um, instances of it, the focus was just on, say, police violence against Black males. And it's only more recent that the focus has been on a Breonna Taylor who also was a victim of police violence. Well, she's not the first victim. But for many um, years, there, there wasn't an intersectional analysis of police violence against BIPOC people, Black, Indigenous, people of color. It was focusing mainly on the violence against males, and particularly Black and brown males. But in fact, an intersectional approach allows us to step back and to look at other factors. We can factor in class, we can factor in gender, we can factor in race. And in fact, when you think about the Black Lives Matter movement, it's quite informative because that original movement came out of the work of, of queer women who were focused on the disproportionate targeting of trans males trans females of color. That's where the first focus was um, on the Black Lives Matter movement. It was Black trans females. And again, that intersectional frame is, is critically important. And this is why people who think that Black Lives Matter means only Black Lives Matter are so off base. It always had an intersectional root. These were queer women of color who were addressing these issues. And so of course it was in Gender was always in the room. Sexual orientation was always there. Race was always there. And so the um, notion of a matrix and the notion of intersectionality is important so that we look beneath the surface to actually what's going on underneath. And these subtle forms of oppression need to be appreciated in order to be addressed. You cannot really address that which you cannot see and cannot name. Which takes us to really um, the idea that, you know, everybody's involved and it's everybody's responsibility. And there we need to understand our relationship and how we are interconnected with one another as human beings. This is the, the underlying critical point of multicultural studies. Critical multiculturalism is really about conscientizing this fact that we as human beings are interconnected and interrelated. And when we think about the problem that we're in, we have to understand that um, it's everybody's responsibility because we are all connected and someone else's suffering is also my suffering. Dr. King said it really well, right? He said that inequality anywhere, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. 
And he went on to say that we are all connected in a network of mutuality, a, um, a coat, a single coat of destiny. And some of us are targeted directly, but that impacts everyone indirectly because we are all tied together in this, in this fabric. And so that, that idea I think is pivotal, pivotal because the ways in which we have historically been socialized throughout our lives and throughout our, the histories of our peoples, right? Has, to been, has been to identify ourselves as tribes, as ethnic groups, as particular cultures, as particular re religions and so forth. And so we have focused and emphasized those differences. So we're talking about a new level of conscientizing the notion that we are in fact each other's keeper, right? That that person who you might not think of as your brother or your sister is part of your village. The village now has been expanded to the globe. And so this is, this is critically important. And the more privilege that you have, say if you're a white, rich, male, straight, able-bodied Christian in this society, then you have tremendous privilege. You're overprivileged in, in relationship to to multiple categories. And it's important to, to reflect upon this and to think about the ways in which you can utilize that power and that privilege, right? As an ally for others. So when we think about the reality that we're facing, we need to want, we wanna think about it in its full dimensions. We wanna get down to, to the core of it and not just think about the manifestations of it. We want to be able to utilize the, our language and to understand that there can be explicit types of discrimination. And then there's also implicit bias. The implicit bias can be as harmful as the explicit. And in fact, we know that historically, the implicit has become more um, prevalent than the explicit. So to raise our conscience to the level to appreciate the fact that some of our implicit biases are impacting our decision-making to the point that they are corrupting many of our judgments and many of our interactions and decisions that stem from those judgments is important if we're going to be that change we want to see in the world. And then to understand how these beliefs, these notions that we have about people are institutionalized, say within the family, say within the religion, say within the culture, say within the uh, criminal justice system that these notions become institutionalized. And many times it's not about um, bad people having bad intentions, creating bad outcomes. It's good people who have good intentions, yet they still systemically target certain individuals or disengage when those individuals are targeted. So this reality underlies what we're talking about. And we've talked about it in terms of patriarchy. We've talked about how, if we think of ourselves as the leaves of the tree and we think of the small um, branches of the tree being our interactions in clubs and groups and with peers and so forth, and that the trunk of the tree is really the institutions of the society we have to also be able to appreciate that the values, the values of the system are the roots. What is manifesting above ground is often what is institutionally and historically established beneath the ground, the roots. <clears throat> 
And if we want to rid ourselves of the ills of patriarchy, of sexism, then we have to understand that we might be fighting the battle at the level of the leaves and the branches, but in order to really make headway into disrupting and overturning the harms of patriarchy, we're going to have to really get dig deep into the values of males wanting to dominate and control females and historically having the physical power and then the institutional power to do so. And that, that this is ingrained in our cultures. And yes, it's a cultural value, but that doesn't mean it can't not be reflected upon. It cannot be problematized. It cannot be, it cannot be dealt with in the context of asking, is this principle in the present moment something that is productive or more destructive for us as a family, as a people? These questions should be asked and they can be asked, but it's important for all of us to appreciate the dimensions of the problems that we're dealing with. If we're dealing with, for instance, police violence, we're not talking about just bad policemen. Most of those policemen are no worse than anybody else in the society. They come from the same societies in which we live. And we find many societies around the world where the police are really hard to distinguish from other people. The notion of having police that have the, the license to go out and to kill people who are not committing a crime is abhorrent in most of the civilized countries on earth. So what's going on to create that type of deranged behavior in the society? Well, it has to do with, with our history. It has to do with the values around race and class that have been inculcated in our culture over time and how those values then become expressed when you have such a differential in power between an armed citizen, I mean, an armed, say, police officer and an unarmed citizen, when that citizen is not viewed as a full citizen, where that person is not viewed as a, few, uh, a full human being, and where that because the person, say the black or brown person, the red person, the yellow person, the queer person, the trans person is not viewed as a full human being and a full citizen, then their rights as a citizen are not forefronted. And the ability to take their life becomes easier. And the ability to justify the loss of their life becomes easier because it becomes acceptable because the police are socialized in the same system as the rest of us. And so the values, the core values of the society are values that have been hmm, internalized by all or most of the individuals in the society, not just those in the police force. So the tree is helpful in that. The other thing is to keep in mind is that we are often held back by these myths and Alan Johnson points these out that, well, it's always been that way. Well, no, it hasn't. Humans, one thing about human beings is that we're dynamic and our societies have changed. And it's easy to see, you can just have a conversation with your grandparents or if you're lucky enough, your great grandparents and see the wide gap between your understanding of the world and their understanding of the world. So don't fall into the idea that things have always been this way. No, they were, the tree was, was established and has been perpetuated over time, but it takes different forms in different times and in different places. And it also is not inevitable that which has been constructed socially can be deconstructed. 
Now, deconstructed and destroyed are two different things, just like defunding, right? And um, not funding are two different things. Systems of power and privilege in the society happen because people participate in these systems and that participation is dynamic and nothing is inevitable, particularly with human beings. Our capacity to change is tremendous. Another myth is, is that I as an individual, what can I do? I'm just one person up against this huge system and what I do would not matter much in the larger scheme of things. Well, this is not true. This is called Gandhi's paradox. The Mahatma Gandhi was able to help transform a society in South Africa and then went to India and helped to rid India of the British colonialism at its height and liberate his entire continent. And he was not um, a god, nor was he a saint. He was a human being who was dedicated to just outcomes for people. That one individual was able to make tremendous change. And we have so many examples like that. Well, not everybody is the Dr. King and not everybody is, is a Gandhi. Or, but each of us has the capacity to make real change. I mean, I had a student, I'll tell you a story. I had a student years ago, it was about this time in the quarter and we were talking about this need to really um, um, begin to think about how we're gonna take our knowledge and really apply it in the world um, develop the skills to apply it in the world to make positive social change. And the student said to me, well, you know, Dr. J, um, I really, I realize that I have a responsibility to make change, but I don't see that, that there's much I can do. You know, I'm, I'm working a couple of jobs. I'm going to school. I'm raising two kids. The, the, the best I can do is like, just teach my, my children to be good people and to not, not judge people by the color of their skin or their sexual orientation. I said, that is huge. If, if you can produce two children, right? And send them out into the world and those children are, are non-biased human beings who treat people based on their character and not their color or their sexual orientation, I said, you made a tremendous contribution to the world because if every parent had done that, we wouldn't be dealing with this subject at all in the first place. And so we can, we can make our contributions in different ways and on different scales. Everybody has to make it within their own sphere of influence. But how we rear a child is a tremendous contribution and then a major, major contribution to the movement for human rights. So we need to do something. Those little steps help, like voting in an election can help. And we sometimes are gonna make people uncomfortable with the actions that, that we take. And, we and that's why we increase our knowledge and increase our skills so that we can manage those situations when people do become uncomfortable so that the outcome of what we say and what we do is positive. The path of least resistance prevents people from um, engaging when they see something that is discriminatory or oppressive. And it's important for us to emphasize this point that Many of us have internalized these lessons that we have received that cause us to say, oh, that situation has nothing to do with me. I don't know that woman. Well, if you sit there and allow someone else to harass, to demean, to dehumanize a, another 
person, then you are part of the problem. You create, you're helping to create license. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to on your own stop someone. But there's many actions that people can take short of confrontation with someone that can be positive to these outcomes. And this is one of the things that we want to uh, pay a little bit of attention to. Increasing our knowledge is so important, but increasing our skill set comparable with that knowledge is even more important. And we have to understand how we've been socialized to take the path, path of least resistance. And we want to make a connection between what we are learning, both at the knowledge level and at the skill level, and our engagement of the world. Because in multicultural studies, what we're suggesting is engage the world and try to make positive change to the best of your ability within your sphere of influence. That's all we're saying. And in order to do that, it's important that we see ourselves as interconnected to one another. Friere says that too. We, we cannot, none of us can be fully human if we participate in the dehumanization of others. And part of that participation is to be silent in the face of oppression. That is giving a green light to the oppressor. And so we have to find ways for us to engage in a positive manner that's going to create outcomes that reduce the oppression. And so I like to think of it on a curve. And I like to think at one end of the curve, you have complete inaction, which is, and you can have negative behavior. And then on the other end of the curve, you have your positive action. Most people find themselves somewhere in the middle. So I want to think of it like this. If you see something that is happening, say you're riding the bus and you see someone who is harassing another person on the bus, if you really have the knowledge, you have the power, you have the skills, disrupt it. Disrupt it. Stop it. If you don't, think of a way to confront it, maybe with other people, so that you disrupt it. If you can't do that, bear witness to it. Let the person know that you're watching. Right? If, if you cannot stand your ground and let the person know that you're wa watching, walk away maybe and talk to someone else. This is still on the positive side of the spectrum. If you cannot manage to do it, any of that, at least feel disturbed that you're, you're witnessing oppression. That's all positive. The least you can do is, is be disturbed because Gradually over time, that might lead you to have to increase your knowledge and to increase your skill set to the point that you can think of something more positive to do than just feel disturbed. On the other end of the spectrum begins with people who are unaware. If you're oblivious to oppression when it's happening around you, you're part of the problem. If you actually are aware of the oppression and you do nothing in the face of the oppression, you're part of the problem. There was a saying about, um, by, by a Lutheran preacher, he was, he was talking about Nazi Germany and he, it, it goes something like this, is that when they came for um, the gyps, the, the homosexuals, I wasn't homosexual, I did nothing and they took the homosexuals away. <laughs> 
when they came for the gypsies, uh, I wasn't gypsy, so I did nothing and they took the gypsies away. When they came for the Jews, I wasn't Jewish, I did nothing and they took the Jews away. And then when they came for me, there was nobody left to protect me. Being a neutral bystander is detrimental, not only to the person who's being, persons or persons, community that's being targeted, but it's detrimental to yourself in the long, in the long run. Being passive, your, 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 your response sometimes is to be a passive, passive participant in the oppression. So you see somebody harming someone else and you sit back and you laugh at it. That is passive participation and it's as bad as the active participation. It's different in degree, but it is very disruptive and hurtful to be aware that something oppressive is happening and to participate in it at a passive level. And of course, if you're the actual um, perpetrator, then you're on the other end of the spectrum. So the idea here is, is that we have degrees of participation and we need to understand that even to feel disturbed about oppression is the beginning of possible change. I believe that strongly. So there's, there's a lot we can do. Acknowledge the trouble exists, change how we think about the situation, clean our lens, and see our connection to that other human being that we're mutually connected, to not turn our back on them. Maintain a critical consciousness, right? To, to, to be able to name and to identify what you see as, as oppression. And we have to commit ourselves to fight oppression wherever we find it. It's not until that commitment is made that we're going to then start to see oppression where we weren't seeing it before. We have to have that commitment, just like we want people to step in if something, ha if someone is harming us, we've got to also be willing to step in and to engage when other people are being similarly harmed. And moving towards summary, I just want us to be able to think about, again, and this is something that appeared in another PowerPoint, but we want want to be able to really think categorically and to understand that we have different identity categories, ability, class, gender, race, sexual orientation. And you have groups that are in the norm and groups that are otherized. And there are certain assumptions about you if you're in the normative group, and there are certain assumptions about you if you're in the other group. So if we think about, for instance, um, sexual orientation, we have the straight and then we have LGBTQA. That is the other in terms of sexual orientation. And there are certain assumptions that follow from that. All of these assumptions follow. If you are in the otherized group, if you're queer, then um, if you're queer, you are rejected. Whereas if you're straight, you tend to be accepted and preferred. If you're queer, all of these apply. If you're queer, you tend to be ignored and stigmatized. People make assumptions about you just because of who you're attracted to. You also tend to be undervalued, underprivileged, thought to be undeserving, often disempowered when you're queer. You see? And the opposite of that is when you're straight. When you're straight, you are accepted. You're the center of attention. You're overvalued. You're overprivileged. You're, you're, you're thought of as, in, you think of yourself as being entitled to certain things. And when queer people get stuff, that they're somehow getting something special. No? If a person is asking, say, for the right to be married, you marry who you love because you're straight. They're asking for the same right that you have as a, as a citizen, not for any special treatment. So this, this table helps you because it helps us one thing, make that distinction between the normative group and the otherized group. And it's looking at these categories. And this is just the beginning. Human beings have almost 
countless number of identity cate categories where they choose to target other humans. So I hope this chart is helpful. I just want to explain to you how it works. And then in closing, just remember, um, we've got to choose the more difficult path and not go with the path of least resistance. We've got to increase our knowledge and skills and promote change. We need to take action where we can, like supporting the rights of women, like getting involved in the Me Too movement, um, taking the time to really understand what are the issues in that movement. Um, we need to pay attention to different forms of oppression. And this is, this is a critical point at a um, personal level, but also it means to examine both the interpersonal interactions, but also to be able to scrutinize and examine systems and institutions as well. We want to look for patterns in institutions and we want to have an analysis that understands how people are socialized to take the path of least resistance in institutions. I'll go back to the example with the police. Why is it that disproportionate numbers of poor people of color are targeted for nonviolent crimes? Well, that's path of least resistance. It is much easier to target a person who is defenseless than a, a person who can defend themselves. I use the example of like drug bus. The consequences um, for making a drug bus in a poor community of color is much less than making a drug bus at the University of Washington, as an example. Why? Because of the differential power and privilege of the people that you would be engaging with and the families that you would be engaging. What are the consequences if the, if the drug bus goes wrong? Think of Breonna Taylor. What was the consequences when it went horribly wrong? Well, everybody's acquitted. Why? Because the system pulled together to give the benefit of the doubt to the officers who were firing wildly. One officer was held responsible for endangering her neighbors who happened to be white because some of his stray bullets went into their apartment. But there was no um, body held responsible for taking the life of this woman. And so what I'm suggesting here is, is that we have to begin to pay attention to the outcomes of um, systems because by watching that, we start to understand, well, who, just because you have more poor people of color in jail does not mean that more people, uh, poor people of color are committing crimes. It means that more of them are being targeted for uh, surveillance and arrest. Take drug cr crimes. If the, if the police really wanted to make a lot of drug busts, every weekend, they could take their vans, well, outside of COVID, up to Greek Row uh, at any university that I'm familiar with in this country, and they can make a lot of drug busts, but they don't. They would rather take their resources into poor communities and break down doors in poor communities and arrest people there. Why? Path of least resistance. And it's important for us to be able to examine institutions in that way because institutional reform is only gonna come through that lens. So what can we do? We got to work with other people, uh, unite, um, form coalitions. Uh, we need to understand um, the need to kind of respect everybody for who they are and not judge people by their color or their gender, or their sexual orientation, their ability, their class, or their religion, right? And we need to take the time to, to in, in, overcome our fears and engage with people across difference because that's where we get the, um, the build the relationships. And that's where we gain the, the, the 
realization that this human being is no different than myself, except for their color, except for who they love, except for how they, how they dress, right? And that realization helps to reinforce the notion of mutuality and mutual responsibility for one another's well-being. We have to start to define the world for ourselves because what has happened in all our societies is that the people who are in power have created the definition. Those who are in power define and those who define are in power. They maintain their power that way. So we have to question the machine. We have to question many of the um, definitions and assumptions that we are exposed to at a very early age. And the positive side of doing all of this is that take, for instance, white people. People can free themselves and by overcoming the guilt that they might have around their privilege and around their power and around what's happening in their name, right? By becoming an ally, by taking positive action that's actually going to change the outcome from people who are being targeted. But again, we do not want to take action before we reflect, before we investigate, and we want to act appropriately within our sphere of influence with the proper knowledge, research, and skills necessary to bring about a positive outcome at the end of the day. And at that point, I would like to um, end this lecture and wish you all well. Be well, stay well.